Ahoy hoy everybody, I'm Nourish Fred, and today we're gonna go into the new blog post that got released today. Uh, I know that change is scary, but luckily, all you have to do now is concentrate, and we'll go into the corn campaign mechanics, which we now know of. We'll interpret them, and uh, we'll try not to cut any corners with that either. I mean, I say that just for the puns, it'll be like a TLDR, and I'll just try to explain it as I see it. And how it'll be used. So um, enjoy. All right. So first off, we have the Skull Throne, right? Well, starts off with blood for the blood god, skulls for the Skull Throne. Really weird because even in the corn trailer, the blood DLC is an yes. So uh, I mean, it's kind of awkward yelling blood for the blood god and like nothing comes out of the people you cut, right? A little bit weird. Anyway, it'll be Scarbrand, the wow, well, really important dude for corn. Essentially, greater demon of corn. He um, gets tricked by Singe to go and attack Daddy Corn, and gets yeeted into a wall. Comes out brain damaged and doesn't have good uh, wings anymore to fly. So all he can do is murder now. There's no coherent thoughts more than murder, rage, and uh, things like that. Always fun. Now, skulls for the skull throne. This will be basically their special currency, from what I know. Um, they do say it's an important currency for his warriors as favor. And gold for the other factions, so let's go with like that's their actual currency, right? You get that from battle sieges, post battle decisions, dilemmas, buildings, anything else. It's basically just if it says here that it's like money, it's just post battle loot, you know, it's uh, you get some dilemmas and things like that. It's very good. Uh, we want it to be more like a paradox game where we get more events and happenings, you know, that's always cool. Also says here that corn does not care whence the blood flows, so you can just find piles of skulls as well. It's kind of untrue. The uh, corn is also the god of honor. And there's no honor in like you know, giving him baby skulls or something like that. He doesn't care about that. Uh, skulls are very important though for corn in the lore. There is a book where one champion is trying to make an entire road just of skulls, miles and miles long, just to be able to uh, you know summon demons into the world. Essentially, it also says that if you actually want to. Settle a place, it'll be a large amount of skulls that you have to pay because they don't really want to settle anywhere. They just want to continue on to uh, fight and destroy all the time, which uh, kind of makes it sound like it's more like a horde faction with some bases everywhere, like some city here and there. How good that will work, we'll have to see, right? But apparently, the campaign will be more akin to a uh, an actual beastman campaign where you just raise sack, make a you know kind of herd stone or like a corn center, um, a little corn field if you will, if you will. Let's have the blood call, which is basically that when you uh, take a settlement and you want to raise that, you either get skulls for the skull throne or blood for the blood god. Skulls for the skull throne just gives you apparently here like a steady number of a thousand skulls. Seems really weird. I thought we had learned this lesson with uh, uh, Ten in One's sacrifice mechanic, where if you take a really large sell settlement, you should probably get more than a thousand. And if you take a smaller one, it shouldn't, you know, guess it should. It still gives you a thousand apparently. So it, I personally think it'll be, it should vary, and very likely it'll be changed to that later on as well. And it says here it's predictable if useful. And that doesn't make sense. Nobody likes that. Uh, nobody likes it with Tenny One's mechanics, and uh, we'll see how it goes now. Blood for the Blood God, though, I imagine a lot of people will be using. It just um, replenishes your forces, and you get these Blood Hosts, uh, which seems pretty cool. A Blood Host is basically an army that doesn't replenish, you can't recruit from it. It's like the Blood Voyage, essentially, uh, that you get to control. So it's apparently like the old Beastman and Orc Wasp, where they would spawn an extra army to run around, but you get to control it this time. Uh, as I said though, it won't replenish, it won't do anything else. But if you go to a different settlement, that blood host can actually, you know, spawn another one. And so forth and so on. So that can actually be really, really cool. They don't cost anything. So that's actually a very interesting mechanic to see how that one will work. As long as the blood hosts aren't like really weird army compositions that you can't do much about because on legendary you kind of want to win your battles uh, you kind of want to have you know good stuff to win them with as well uh, that's why the it's not just because people are lazy and bad at the game that you want to have the doom stacks it's because the game kind of demands you have that because otherwise the armies will just dwindle down there'll be attrition to death against stuff 
And since they can't actually replenish or anything like that, we'll have to see how useful they actually get in reality. But on paper, it sounds goddamn awesome. Or should I say amazing. Mace, get it? That's, uh, that's another word for corn. <laughs> cool thing also, they will spawn with full movements. So they can just go off and start killing. Which is really cool. Which means that you can kind of use it like a momentum thing that as long as you can uh, reach another settlement, you can probably cover the, uh, the world really fast, actually. Because one thing can just go to um, and murder one settlement, and then that'll go in the same turn to the next one, and so forth and so on. So technically, I can actually be really OP. I, think, I don't know how they're going to control that, if they even thought about that, but that can probably... I think we're going to see some speedrunning shenanigans going around there. Like, if you actually manage to kill off one place, hopefully they'll have some scaling, like from that tier, turn 5 or turn 1, they can't be a full army, because that would be insane. But, you know what, we'll have to see. Maybe um, it's just going to be something like, if you have 17 dudes in your army, it's going to be 17 dudes in the Blood Host, uh, or it's just going to be with tech or whatever, but it does sound pretty fun. Also pretty cool, if you have a settlement in a province, and one uh, the other settlements are raised, you'll just automatically get those places. They'll just be colonized at no cost, which is really good. Another interesting thing is also that even though you lose a battle, uh, they do say you generate skulls, which is beneficial to you. We'll see how that one goes. Now, bloodletting sounds like a cool idea. Uh, from what I understand, it's just a souped-up war mechanic. Because right now, with the war um, that the greenskins have, you just have uh, that you just fight stuff. A meter goes up with more the more you win, and you get more growth, you get more, well, bonuses to your faction. It seems like the same thing here as well. You just get replenishments, you get growth uh, faction wide, and it um, seems pretty cool. It is one of those snowball mechanics, though. So if you do fail at some points, or at the start, you might as well just restart the campaign a lot of the time, so you can just, you know, power through that and uh, wonder why everybody else likes the faction and you don't. That's also a viable option. And obviously this also works with the blood host that they will go out and, you know, increase that as well. It's just faction-wide bloodletting. They also have unholy manifestations and cults. Now, cults seem to be like undercities, essentially, from the scenes um, blog. And, um, you know, we'll see how well those works. Uh, the manifestations seem to be kind of like rights, and the rights will be uh, that you can either spawn a small cornet army to attack your own army, triggering bloodletting, giving your skulls favor. That's always good uh, in a pinch, especially with the war mechanic that we just went through. You can get the call of battle, which costs a thousand global corn corruption. I'm not really sure how the corn corruption will work and how the corruption based currency will work, but uh, we'll find out. Won't we? In reality, it might just be that you spread your corruption, it fills up like a different kind of currency. Uh, it might be something that you get on the side, but we'll just have to see in the end, right? I'm not sure if they went through that in any blog or uh, anything like that, yes. The next one is just you get 50% more campaign movement range. Always cool. The Slaughter Incarnates costs twice as much stats. Uh, it doubles the army gains from battle several turns. I mean, we've seen, like, getting more post-battle loose other times, right? So it's always good for a horde faction, though, and if they want to try that kind of thing. I, don't, I think that when I say, like, horde faction, clearly they have settlements as well. I don't think CA will do horde factions in the same way that we've, ha we've seen them before, where you just have the one horde and nothing else, because those never work. Like, you never really get... A good faction like that. People just don't enjoy those. So um, we'll see how that one turns out. Next one is Corn's Clear, costs 3000. And that one just um, disables movements for one of your armies. And then it raises settlements right next to this. Which means that if you use that on a blood host, I guess that is free. On uh, That is in a region of a powerful place that's you otherwise would not be able to take, and it just raises that and you get another blood host, it once again seems like a, a thing that might, maybe they haven't thought out. 
uh, particularly well, but maybe this will be the stomping one, right? Why not just put a blood hose, like kill some small settlement near the bastion? You know, you take one of the gates out with this rice, and um, you're in Cathay, and you can just murder everything else. Rice? That sounds weird. The AI can never use these, so I wouldn't worry too much, I hope. The different kind of cult buildings, though, for the undercities in the different settlements, in one of the enemy settlements, uh, it's just going to be, uh, you know, one for generating skulls every turn, one for um, extra post-battle loot, one that generates more skulls uh, if a lord of any faction is present, and the arena, which seems really, really cool, which just makes it so that it destroys the undercity cult and uh, teleports your main army there. Which you gotta admit, it sounds really, really cool, because basically, if you manage to get one to the other side of the world, you can just use it there, and then you're teleporting over there. And then you have one on the other side, and you just fight and fight and fight. And this sounds uh, pretty amazing, depending on how we actually build uh, the cults, how we uh, manage to build the things, well, how we manage to spread it, rather. It's um, gonna be pretty cool, I think. Tech tree, I get wildly mad when I see these. Uh, I say wildly, I mean, obviously I'm dead inside, so this is about as much as emotional as I guess. But why can't they make a UI that just fits everything in? Why do I have to scroll this much? You can clearly see here, like you can clearly see here that it's like what? You can have this one four times more. Do I have to like, like really scroll and drag this one all the way? That's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. That's like, why would you make this? Does nobody like learn how to make a UI or whatever? I just like this boggles my mind. I have been using the um, HD improvement UI mod for you know God knows how long now, and I will never not use it because it just makes it like you know like you're using a monitor from 2008 and onwards, where you don't sit there with a 22 or 21 inch monitor or some shit like that. Now, it does say that some things will be used for, um, like, some things you have to spend skulls on, some things you have to unlock later on, like the beastmen also have battle unlocks that you have to do certain things to unlock your technology. Like, for example, you have to, uh, you know, summon Cygors during combat, or you have to do uh, something else, you know? So that seems to be a theme that they still go on, and that's a cool mechanic. I like that. So um, otherwise, I'm 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 pleased with this. But god damn it, make it so I don't have to scroll. It's not that big of a deal to just have you know what the hell, man. There's so much real estate here that you're not using. There's so much, like you're <laughs> all right. Demonic diplomacy. What does that mean? It means that all of the chaos factions, except for Slanesh. We'll start a war with everybody who isn't chaos inclined. Here it mentions that you can still, you know, talk to uh, other chaos, demon chaos, well, demons of chaos factions. You still talk to Skaven and Norsk and Warriors of Chaos. Probably also Beastmen. In the lore, if a corn warrior or any other demon would find a bunch of Beastmen, they would basically say, hey, you follow us now. And the beastman would say, nah ah, and then the demons or the champion would just absolutely beat the hell out of them, and then they would all follow. And that's how simple it is. So hopefully it's something like that here as well, where you just find a beastman, you uh, punch a couple of times, and then they follow you. And then you have a vassal. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And also important to note, the one playable faction for Korn will have diplomo diplomatic penalties with, well, even the other Chaos ones, because he did betray his master in the end before he got yeeted into the wall, uh, so people don't trust him that well. I mean, understandable, honestly. Now, overall, we have to see more of the faction roster, but... These campaign mechanics seem really, really cool, actually. I'm really liking the kind of green skin, Skaven, um, Beastman kind of play style, which seems really, really cool. Probably will mention Skaven mechanics for every single one of these because they have some bonkers stuff constantly. 
uh, so everything will be reminded of them. But um, on the campaign map, I don't see any issues with these dudes. I am always scared of how corn will go on the battlefield. There's somebody with as much ranged. When range is clearly like much stronger in in the actual game, and the new defensive turrets that you can do the choke points with and stuff like this in battles, I don't know. But on campaign, it's gonna be really really cool. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. They apparently have some really cool battle mechanics, and we'll be going through those later on whenever that get, gets released for their roster and stuff. So thank you everybody for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown. Hope I didn't shock too much information at you all at once. Hope you enjoy the corn conspiracy theories that I have here on how they're going to be played. Um, if you enjoyed this one as well, you can also follow me on uh, Twitch. Twitch.tv slash NerdishFred. Always really cool whenever you guys come in there. Say hello as well. Uh, like and subscribe to the video. It helps the channel a lot. I really like all the comments. I read everything. I respond to everything. Uh, you know, the likes and everything gives them, um, helps the algorithm, I guess. I don't exactly know how this works. You can follow on Twitter, at Thread. You see any of my affiliate links if you're actually going to be buying any of the games or any game at all, because I do have a lot of affiliate links if um, that helps the channel as well. And me, that's it for me today. I'll see your cute faces next time.